What's up, guys? Um, I'm hey, Eli, hey. and I'm getting this cut right now. So this is a little <laughs> informal meeting. Um, I'm so glad to have you guys here today. Um, I know, especially uh, in this season, uh, we have the Resilient Men's Conference coming up at Cornerstone. Come on! Um, I'm super excited about um, one of the first men's conferences I get to go as an adult. Wow. Um, so we get to experience that in a different light. Um, but I'm glad to have you guys here today because I think it's a necessary conversation that we need to have um, inside the community as well, um, outside of just the church. Um, and that, that conversation is about uh, masculinity as a mm -hmm. whole. Um, I know me personally growing up, I'm 22, uh, so I'm a fairly new young man. I like to <laughs> think so myself. Um, but just navigating exactly what that looks like to be a man um, and what it means to be masculine. Um, I know me growing up in a society of um, technology, everybody's on social media giving their two cents yeah. Yeah. on what it means to be a man. Um, and I believe that it's not enough um, of the older generation to kind of be in that conversation as well. Um, so, Tremaine, if you would like to kind of just give your backstory on how you have become a man um, and the things you've learned inside of that as well. Yeah, so um, I what... What really sticks out to me about manhood is uh, Tony Evans. Um, he has like a manhood series, right? Kingdom Man. Kingdom Man. Uh -huh. And within that Kingdom Man, he does this. Uh, he's he's a very intricate thinker, but he does this thing. He said, you know, we're all born to to malehood, yep. and then we evolve to boyhood. And that's when boyhood is when we find out what we like. We're playing with swords, yep. Nerf guns, you know, mm -hmm. having fun, and we're still under the jurisdiction of our parents where mom is taking care of us, dad is taking care of us. Uh, and it's when we evolve into manhood is when we are able to be responsible for someone else, right? Mm -hmm. When we can now mm -hmm. take care of someone else. Yeah. And it didn't, like at first I'm like, okay, I'm thinking monetarily, right? But it's not just monetarily, it's spiritually. You know, I have a, a family, I have to spiritually pray over them, spiritually be responsible for them, Adam and Eve. You know, you have to be responsible for them. Then it's emotionally, right? You know, when you have people under your care, children, you know, you have to emotionally be able to be responsible for them. So um, I wasn't a man until <laughs> until I got 30, right? Because I was doing one of the, you know, three or four things that revolved, uh, involved manhood, right? Yeah. I, I had monetarily, I was, bills paid, houses paid, bought my first house at 25, living it up, thought all I was right, a man, right. but mm -hmm. emotionally I was unavailable, um. right? Is when I became available emotionally and then spiritually is when the components for me is where I became a man, when I was to be able to be there for those different categories for the people in my life. It's good stuff. Yeah. Very good. Love yeah, that. Man. Yeah. Phil, yeah. <laughs> what, what, what has your journey been um, in the sense of just becoming a man? Sure. Especially being out of the States as well. It's a whole different oh, ballgame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think that so much of my, you know, success today or um, understanding of what, what leads to success in life is rooted in what was taught to me from my parents at a young age. Mm. Um, I have incredible mom, incredible dad growing up who taught me work ethic and values and ethics and, and culture around those things. And so it was impressed upon me from a young age about what that looks like and how to treat people well, how to treat women well. I have, I have many memories of my parents um, teaching me this is how you treat other people when you're with it when you're with a girl you walk half a step behind her so if she ever wants to walk in front of you then you don't bump shoulders or you know always opening the door for people you know all those kind of things I have many memories from them that would be traditional values that I was raised in that are things that I am teaching my boys now as well um, that we have three little boys and I have conversations with them about when someone's been over at our house and they're leaving to, to go back home, I make sure that they walk them out to their car. Okay, boys, it's time to be a gentleman. You get to walk this person out to their car right now. You know, those kind of yeah. values instilled yeah. at a young age, training them from a young age so that those values don't depart them later in life. And I love something that you shared a moment ago, Tremaine, about how when you shift from a, a boyhood understanding to a to your manhood that's when you become responsible for someone else yeah. mm -hmm. really my understanding as a as a father came from a moment that i remember distinctly mm -hmm. when our eldest who's now 7 years old he was only 3 years old at the time 
and he's, we were playing in, in the front yard, and in a moment, it was the middle of the afternoon, and he said, hey, Dad, uh, th- uh, this evening, when we have dinner, um, I was wondering if we could do this. And it was that phrase of, when we have dinner, struck me. I'm sure he'd said it before, and I'm sure he said it since then, but it was that moment of when he said, when we have dinner, right. as in he had learned that there is a when we have dinner, not yeah. if we have dinner tonight, mm, of maybe we can, you know, it was yeah. when we have dinner, this, and that's when I realized he is so expectant of my provision uh, because of the job that I'm doing as a father. Yeah. And, and that's when I realized like the responsibility of a dad is to provide, providing financially, providing emotionally, providing spiritually. It was that moment that it all clicked for me. My responsibility as a father is to create an environment that my boys can thrive in. Oh, yeah. That's good. <clears throat> that's interesting you said that. Um, I feel like especially where I am in my position, yeah. I am by no means ready <laughs> to have a family. Sure. Um, so, you know, I feel like as a, as a 22-year-old man, you know, um, I put off on some of the things that I would consider masculine because I don't have to worry about the next man or my wife or kids because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm free of that. Yeah. Um, but what what's some things that you've learned prior to having a family that, that kind of geared you to becoming a better man that when you had your family you're ready to go. You know, what were some lessons that you guys learned during that time? Um, Cause I mean, we don't always just click or then maybe you guys did click as a man. I don't know, I'm still looking. <laughs> um, but if you could share that. Yeah, for, for me, it, it was, um, it wasn't before, but it was during. I learned that, it, that it's, it's not about me, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Like it's not about, it's not about me. Mm-hmm. It's about, it's about them, it's about my children, it's about my wife. It's about the future. I'm I'm the one that's looking ahead, right? And I'm the one that's providing. I'm the one that's making sure that everything is going the way it should be going. Me turning around and, and, and trying to get into the weeds, that's no good for my family. But when I make everything about them, you know what I'm saying? And still have time for me, of course, but make sure the big thing's about them. That's the main thing for me, for being, being a man. It's like, and it's when you get those things, when you acquire those things, then you'd be like, aha, that's what he was talking about. But when you don't have those things, it's like, it's all about me. What are you talking about? It's not about anyone else but me. Right. But when you get those things, when you have your first child, when you get married and have a wife, things like that, and you're like, and if you forget, your wife will remind you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is not about you, and that's about them. That was yeah. what it was for me. Yeah. yeah. That's true. So for me, it was when responsibilities increase, so often you are forced to become less selfish. I think when you're young in life, you would, you're just inherently selfish. You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about what food you want to eat. You're thinking about where you want to go. You're thinking about what you want to spend your money on. You're thinking really just about yourself. Your whole worldview is wrapped in yourself, yeah. of yourself. You are the center of your own universe. As your responsibility begins to increase, you have to think about yourself less and less and the things that you become responsible for. So even while that's true in in marriage, while that's true in being a parent, it starts early as you increase your responsibility. So you can do that in your workplace. Now, okay, you've just graduated from college and I've now got responsibilities that I need to take care of, right, in in, in the workplace, in my job. Um, Maybe it's caring for other people. Maybe it's as your parents are aging and those kind of things. As your responsibility in those different spheres and areas increase, now I get to think about myself less and less. Now I have to think about myself less and less. And so even practically, when my wife and I first got married, we were in your kind of place of, I don't know that I'm ready to bring children into this world, but I know that at some stage, I want to be ready to bring children in this world. So how can I get myself to that place where I will be ready when it's time? So we did something simple. We just thought, okay, well, if we're not ready for children to come into the world, we need to get some responsibility around simple things. If I can keep a plant alive for six months, (laughs) then I can progress to the next thing. So I got a house plant, and the first one died, and the next one died. And I'm so thankful that I had a plant to learn on as I was learning responsibility, and I didn't have a child to try and keep up, you know to keep alive first. So we got a plan, they died. And then eventually after we could keep that alive, then we started getting, we got a dog. No, first, before we got a dog, we got a goldfish. 
and the goldfish died and we got a second goldfish and then when we could keep the goldfish alive then we got a dog and when we could keep a dog alive for a little while then that's when we thought we might just now be ready to have kids of our own and so it was that increase of responsibility so it wasn't such a shock to the system of oh it's no longer about me right now it was almost like that progressive step by step of increasing responsibility and thinking about ourselves less and less mm. interesting that I think it's funny how you I, I think it's funny and I also think how clever it is for you to be able to increase the level of responsibility mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times with, when you told me about the plant just now I, I chuckled you know mm -hmm. um, because it's obviously nowhere near the responsibility level of a, of a young child right but being able to learn those principles of taking care of things and managing things I think is so valuable um, for myself I am a recent graduate of Tiffin University so mm -hmm. go guns mm -hmm. <laughs> but even inside of that um, with me making that transition going away from home um, because I wanted that. I feel like that's every young man's dream is, all right, let me get on my own, let me get out the house, let me experience yeah. life for myself. Yeah. Um, and thank God I have uh, parents that were able to push me and navigate me in the right direction and do that appropriately. Um, but it wasn't until I got to school um, when I started to realize the responsibilities that I had to take on for myself. It wasn't mom every day uh, yeah. making sure uh, dinner's on the table and yeah. I gotta get up and go to the cafeteria. And then I still had a cafeteria to go to. But, you know, um, mom wasn't checking my grades, you know. Uh, I, I have to meet with my own professors. I have to make those calls to make sure my transcripts get sent over. Yep. And little by little, as tedious as I thought they were, now looking back to seeing the responsibility that it's, that it's given me um, and, the, and just the things I've learned outside of that, I'm able to manage so much more now. It took time for me to ask for help. And didn't realize it's not a problem to ask for help. It's not right. a problem yep. um, to come out of that isolation because you're not the first person to go through those problems. And I surely won't be the last. Right. Um, but so many young men aren't exposed to that type of uh, conversation um, that I was privy to. Um, so what have you guys learned and what do you guys teach younger youth about isolation and loneliness um, as far as them growing up in a man um, and taking on those responsibilities? Um. T.D. Jakes, it just brought back to me, T.D. Jakes says this thing about how at the age of five, how you need a mentor. Mm -hmm. Then you, at the age of 15, you need a mentor. Yeah. At, your age, at the age of 18, guess what? You need a mentor. Right, still. Yeah. At the age of 25, you still need yeah. a mentor. Yeah. At the age of 40, I need a mentor. Yeah. 45, 50. So we need mentors all throughout our lives. Sure. And never hesitate to ask questions because at the stage of your life, you need a mentor, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's something that we talk to our kids about. Um, our kids never get out of the out of the programming um, because of that. I, w I would feel horrible if at the age of 18 I cut you off and said, hey, you're free to go, you're an adult. You know, and then life hits you and you're like, whoa, I don't know, I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't expecting loneliness. I wasn't expecting the pressure of being a man. I wasn't expecting a child. I wasn't expecting, you know, being in the situation that I'm in. So I want to be able to provide a level of mentorship from them being 18 all the way until I pass away, yeah. you know, um, because that wisdom, it has to fall down so that they can pass the wisdom down. Um, as far as loneliness, um, with the program, we provide a community for young men. Um, guys get in our program and we got kids being best friends. Mm -hmm. We got kids that they literally, one one kid tried to change his name to the other kid's name. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't do that. <laughs> He's like, that's my middle name. I was like, no, but your name is this. We're going to call you this. Well, no, call me what you call him. I'm like, no, we're not doing that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So what we provide is a culture for them. We, we provide a, an environment where they feel safe, where they feel love, where they have an identity. You know, um, And I think that right there is allowing our young men to grow and to mm -hmm. change and to uh, head in the right direction. Yeah. yeah, you were just talking about something that, that struck my attention, the idea of the boys that you have in the program not graduating. And I think so often that's something that we miss because whether it's in high school, the, the kids, the boys that we have that are graduating, we are... Um, pushing them out into the world from college they're graduating pushing them out even within the church you know you go through kids ministry you go through youth, youth ministry and then when you're of age then you get pushed out yep. and so that idea of 
you're graduating, you should be ready, and now you're being pushed. Now, what if someone's not ready at that exactly. stage? You know, And what it also does is it disconnects you from the mentors that you've had in this season yeah. and doesn't necessarily set you up for success in the next season because now I'm being pushed out of youth ministry, I'm being pushed out of high school or call it whatever that is. Oh. If I'm not ready for that next place, then that's where so much failure takes place in the transition that takes place between those two different areas. And when I think about my own life, you talked about how we need a safe place. Mm-hmm. Boys need a safe space. I think that's crucial. I think mm-hmm. that so, so often guys don't have a safe place yeah. to go to have conversations like this yeah. at a barbershop, right? We don't have a safe place to talk about how do I feel about something or how am I processing through something. When, when you look at what loneliness does to the soul, mm-hmm. It, not even how it impacts me emotionally, but loneliness is now impacting me physically as well. The latest studies show that loneliness has the same effect on my body as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. Wow. We've been talking for decades about how smoking cigarettes is right. not healthy for you. Right. Yeah. 15 cigarettes per day is the equivalent of the feeling of loneliness. Wow. Mm. And so now we can start to measure the effect that it's having on me, not just emotionally, physically and spiritually and how that's all wrapped together, the detriment that it's playing on us. And it's felt more in men than it is in women because we don't talk about it. We don't talk about how I'm feeling. We don't talk about I need somebody else. I'm fine within myself and I can process within myself. And so I don't need girls and guys and mentors and other people in my life to create a space. But I think like my heart as a pastor is that our church would be a safe place for people to be able to uh, process, a safe place for people to be able to doubt. Well, you could come and you don't just have to have everything together. You can come when your life is a mess. You can come when everything is going well for you. You can come when you've got doubts and you can come when you're full of faith that you can come and it's a safe place for you no matter where you are on the journey, no matter how jacked up your life is, no matter how together your life is. It's a safe place for you to be able to engage and express who you are, not just project the external image mm-hmm. yeah. of the man that you are, yeah. but that you can express the internal man as well in that safe space. Yeah. I, I really like how you guys mentioned the safe space. Um, I think as a man, it's very hard to find that safe space. Yep. Um, it's interesting, I just had a conversation with my sister and she was asking me, why are you so passionate about sports? Why? But what, what is it about men that just get them so excited? Mm-hmm. And I I just thought, you know, it's just what we love to do, you know, we're warriors, we're gladiators, yeah, you yeah. know, and that's that's just the answer that I responded with. But now having this conversation, it's pretty evident that it's the safe space. My early memories of just being able to have friends came when I played T ball baseball. Me having those early relationships and having a mentor outside of my own father was my my uh, fourth grade basketball coach. You know, and I find that sports have been such an intricate part of who I've become as a man. But at the same time, I know a lot of men who are done with sports and poof, Mm -hmm. you know, that that safe space is no longer there Um, because we aren't not for lack of better words, emotionally intelligent to be able to express how we feel outside of the sport. A lot of times those sports become our outlets. So with that being said, uh, just to share a little bit about myself, um, I didn't have the greatest college basketball career. Um, You know, uh, I came in, I didn't really have the work ethic that I should have had. So with me end up taking a year off from playing basketball during COVID, I had to kind of readjust. What what does it mean to play or just be a a, a man at a college and not play sports? This is the first time I've ever been set in that type of environment. Socially, I was not really hanging with the basketball team because that's not my crew anymore. who do I hang out with? Who do I talk to? What spaces? What, what table do I even sit at at lunch? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I look, I feel completely lost. Um, but it was that experience of me having to navigate, what are the hobbies you like to do outside of playing sports? Yep. You know, do you enjoy music? Do you like to read? Go take a walk. You know, yeah. I, I was able to throw myself into the fire and be able to learn who I am as an individual. But it also took me getting over, again, that isolation and also being able to willingly learn the emotional intelligence that I had. So that's a little bit about myself, but I also want to hear from you guys about 
when was it for you all <clears throat> where you were able to learn more about yourself and how has that also shifted the way that you've conducted yourself as a man just in society not even just for your families yeah yeah I think that's a great question um, and I think that I've struggled with this for years because I'm an extrovert mm. so I'm so driven to be with other people that I seldom took time younger in life to learn about who I am and what my identity is because I would just surround myself with other people mm. and so because I'm surrounded by other people I'm not having to learn about who I am and what I'm passionate about or what I'm driven toward because I'm surrounded by other people. So in many ways, I allowed other people to be a distraction for myself. So then I, you know, I'm going through life, I'm going through high school, I'm going through college, and I have no idea who I am. Hmm. And then now I realize it, when I'm a young adult that I don't even like spending time with myself because I don't know who I am. So then that just makes the situation even worse because... Now, not only do I not like who I am, I don't know who I am. And so when I have alone time, I immediately fill that with other people. Now, that, that void uh, in my space of wanting to fill that with now other people. So now I'm a, a young adult having no idea who I am. And then my career, you talk about your basketball career, my soccer career begins to collapse around me. And I realize I've built my identity in the things that I'm good at. Not even just the things that I enjoy. So my soccer career, everything that I've been working on for the last 10 years, my identity is wrapped in that thing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I can't do that one thing anymore. Mm -hmm. And I realize, oh, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I enjoy doing. I don't know, besides the people that I roll with and the things that we get into, I don't know who I am. And so I took a good couple of years of uh, not paying attention to sports in general and just learning who am I and what do I enjoy doing. Yeah. Um, and, and that was so crucial for me because so much of our identity, I think, as guys is around what am I good at mm -hmm. because we don't want to fail in things. Certainly, we don't want to fail publicly in things. That's yeah. like we were talking earlier about the safe space. We only want to do things that we're good at publicly because we don't want to fail. We don't want to be seen failing. So then our identity gets found in the things that I'm good at, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's been helpful for me is knowing it's okay to fail and then it, learning in my times that I'm by myself and when I'm just hearing my own voice and hearing God's voice, learning about who I am as well at my core beyond just what I'm good at. Yeah. That's so good. Mm -hmm. Like both stories. So, and I think God has a way of putting us in the valley right to, for us to discover who we truly are because I can echo both of y'all stories having something that I kind of put up here mm -hmm. you know and then God kind of like me like all right I'm gonna take that away mm -hmm. I'm taking that away and I'm like in the valley like oh God hurt and pain and the one instance where um, I was just soul searching like who am I what do I like to do what I, I, I was kind of like you I was somewhat of a I'm, I'm an intro extrovert. I don't, know how, I don't know how it works, but I want to be around people sometimes. I don't know that exists, man. <laughs> and I don't want to, my daughter said it's a... It's an ambivert. I, yes, yeah, my daughter see, said that. You know, people that are extroverted <laughs> say go. that they're ambiverted when they're not comfortable being extroverted. Oh, maybe that's what it is. Yeah. Is that a hot take? <laughs> mm, so you're but, an extrovert. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this one particular time when... I really started focusing on me was I um, I like extreme sports so mm -hmm. I like to do crazy things and um, I wanted to go skydiving and when I said who wants to go skydiving social media who wants to go skydiving with me like 50 people were like oh yeah I'm going I'm going I'm like alright meet me up there we're all going to go skydiving together meet me up there like meet me in the plane <laughs> <laughs> no we're in uh, in Jackson, Michigan, okay. uh, to come see skydive, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I get up there and I'm looking around for the crew. Nobody showed, bro. Okay. <laughs> Nobody showed, and no. I'm like, I just drove an hour up yeah. here. Nobody's up here. It's like, all right, you know. So I dug down deep because I was gonna just turn around and just go home. Mm -hmm. You know, but I was like, no, this is an opportunity for me to learn something about myself. Sure. I'm afraid of heights. Mm -hmm. Like. And the guy was like, well, you still want to do it? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, matter of fact, give me the works. 
Instead of 9,000 feet, we're going up 18,000 wow. feet. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we did it. And it was like the most amazing experience. And when I got down, when I got down to the ground, <laughs> I was like, wow. Like, it changed my whole entire life and the perspective I had on everything. Because you don't need a whole crew. Mm-hmm. You don't need a whole crew. Yeah. You just got to have a vision and get going. And God will add the people that he needs to add. That'll preach. And ever since then, that's all I do. I get ready. God gives me something. I go for it. And then God just adds who needs to be a part of it. Yeah. You know? That's good. So skydiving ended up being the thing that I needed. <laughs> that's what God had to do. But see, if everybody had shown up, then you wouldn't have learned that, right? Right. Yeah. Right. I would have still been waiting and wanting to be, you know, involved in the crowd and, and you know, and I thank God for that, um, for that disappointment, you know, because I needed that for him to be like, psych, you know what I'm saying, ain't nobody there, it's just you yeah. and me. And, and then I'm you're lucky. not even doing it for them, you're doing it for yourself mm-hmm. at the end of yes. the day, and you don't learn that when you're still motivated by the crowd. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Tawan, I'd be interested in your take on the, the concept of a safe space that we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you're on, you're on the other side of the chair right now, mm-hmm. and, and you do that, uh, and you create an environment that's a safe space mm-hmm. for guys to come into every single day. A, how do you create that safe space? Mm-hmm. Um, and then B, how, how do you see guys engaging in that space as well? Um, I think uh, that's a great question. Um, I think I've been able to... Uh, create this safe space uh, basically by um, just providing a, a, a place where, I, like you said, uh, where men feel comfortable um, to be able to come and be themselves. Uh, mm-hmm. In a barbershop, uh, I was just talking to uh, Eli earlier today, uh, we had teamed up with a local, uh, you know, the hospital here at ProMedica, and um, we was doing some research and we was noticing how uh, a lot of men don't like to go to the hospital, right. okay, and uh, they don't want to get checked, you know, for like a diabetes or or any di- issues they're having, but uh, the barbershop seems to be a place where men will come, and uh, because they come get their haircut, they trust us as a uh, barber, and they trust us as their uh, counselor or their friend. They will come here and um, feel safe and feel open to be able to discuss things they're dealing with, you know, and um, I think that to providing that safe space, uh, you have to have a place where they feel they can be honest, be open, and sometimes it takes me as the uh, uh, you know, barber to uh, kind of open up that, you know, if I see them dealing with something or I see them kind of a little off, just kind of talking to them and uh, getting them to open up. And uh, and it seems like that has worked very well um, where I see my, most of my clients and most of my, um, even even the people that work here, you'll find them feeling very comfortable about talking about everything, you know, uh, mm-hmm. from like, you know, family, uh, church, the children, all the above. So uh, I think that has been the main thing, just letting them know they can talk about anything and, and basically starting with yourself, you know, you letting them know uh, some, some things you're dealing with. I mean, it's always a kind of a give and take for me with my, my client, you know, and uh, it's been, it's worked well for me. Second, yeah. second part of the question you were saying? Well, I love what you said about that first part is that, that your goal is to connect with people. Mm-hmm. And so... Uh, it's not just immediately tell me about your diabetes, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Right, because no one's going to open up, and that's not how you right. create a safe space. Yeah. Let me jump to your insecurities and your vulnerabilities. Mm-hmm. You're building the trust and the connection with the person yes. as you share about yourself and they share about themselves. Mm-hmm. And so while, yes, barber, but also p- posturing in many yes. ways yes. and also counseling in many ways. And so yes. while we have church on Sundays, I've been down here before. We're having church on Saturdays as well at the same time. You know, it's that hard to connect with people yes. and building trust in that journey. That's the thing that I love about the barbershop conversation. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it's been awesome. Um, they, most of my clients allow me to play, you know, music that I think sets an atmosphere. Yeah. Um, but for here at my shop, I, I'm, I've always loved to uh, play spiritual music, gospel music, all different genres. But also like to play. Uh, some sermons and and, and just uh, TDJs like you were saying, Miles Monroe, just and not always you know on the churchy side, but more so on the uh, you know that's the normal side, you know, mm-hmm. there's normal life things that we're dealing with, and um and they, they I, I found my clients coming here and really be 
uh, impacted. I would I wouldn't know until they leave. They may leave, but then call me like, man, Tawana, I'm really glad you played that, man. We just listen to you know what you said today or what will be heard on on the TV, man. Really, I needed to hear that, and so it lets me know that I am creating a safe place. It lets mm -hmm. me know that what I'm doing is helping them. We're just cutting their hair, but more so being a counselor, like you said, even some sort of you know minister to them or helping them in some way like that. So, yeah, you know, that's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. What you said was so interesting, right? Like, <clears throat> specifically when you mentioned the the way that you're able to open up that space for guys just to be able to talk. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's interesting in the fact that a lot of times when you're trying to help somebody or you see somebody struggling and I want to come help you, I can't even approach you in that way, especially when I'm talking to a man because I don't need your help. Mm. I got it. I can figure it out myself. Yeah. It, it makes me laugh, too, to think about being in the barbershop as a kid, I remember my dad telling me, hey, don't repeat everything you hear. Cause, you know, because everybody comes from different backgrounds, you know. So I come home telling my mom a story I heard, and my dad's looking at me like, mm -mm, stop, stop, because we got to change barbers if you're picking up that type of stuff. Um, but just seeing how it's connected with me, um, and when I go home, I still try to sneak into my barbershop back home. And I don't even need to cut half the time. Mm -hmm. Just being able to be in that space again, being able to communicate with the people who helped develop me. Um, I think a lot of times the barbershop, um, I think now is getting a little bit more uh, notice in the development of young men. Um, but during that time, I had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea the, the, the role that a barbershop would, would play in my life. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm super thankful. For a barbershop and I'm super thankful to have barbers like yourself who are taking the initiative and understanding the, the space that they're in mm, thank you so I had to thank you for that oh, for sure it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blessing to be able to have this place so and yeah. I, I appreciate it man. Yeah. so <clears throat> as you also mentioned a little bit earlier um, about being able to have that that connection with men uh, as mentors um, what has been some takeaways that you've gained from some mentorships that you've had? So one of the things that comes to mind is uh, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Mm. Wow. And that, so that resonated with me. One of my, um, he's a mentor, but he's a good, he's probably like two years older than me. You know what I'm saying? So he's not even, but he told me that. He said, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And when you uh, strive to do everything with excellence, it doesn't mean if it's just in sports, it also applies to manhood, it applies to fatherhood, it applies to your work ethic, it applies mm -hmm. to everything. How you do one thing is how you do everything. So I think that's my quick answer for, <laughs> for that one, because that really, it changed my life. You know, I don't, I don't, everything I do, I try to do it to the best of my ability, yeah. you know, because how you do one thing and it shows right it shows when others see it and, and when the people that you uh do it for if you're not doing it with, with quality and if you're not doing it with your heart to me just gonna do it yeah. yeah that's how especially with the program if you've been to a programming commitment you know that we are intentional we, we try to think everything through and we do it with our heart yeah because that's what really matters so yeah i was gonna say for me that the my work ethic was one of the things that was taught to me from a young age, and then resilience as well, that you, you gain in sports in, in so many ways that you, can, you struggle to gain in other spaces, right? Because mm -hmm. you can be down, whether I'm playing soccer and you know, we're down three to two, you don't give up 60 yeah. minutes into the game, or if you're playing football, whatever, you don't give up until the game's over, right? Yeah. And so then that translates into life as well that I don't, I'm not going to give up at 30 years old. I'm not going to give up at 45 years old because the game's not over yet. So you learn that resilience that while things may be going against me, while momentum may not be in my favor, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to grind this thing out mm -hmm. because if I'm in it, I still have a chance to win. Yeah. And, uh, and it's only when I give up, that's when failure becomes yeah. my reality. Yeah. Kind of cutting the jam right now, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I appreciate you guys being able to come here, uh, especially during. What about you? Is it is oh. something that the mentor has told you that has? Hmm. My dad, my dad for sure has been my biggest mentor. Will always be my mentor, of course. Um, that's the role he will always play. Um, but one thing that he said recently, uh, but he's always said it to me. But I think in this season in my life, I needed it. Um, he told me, you're not the first one to go through it. Mm. It's simple as that. Mm. Um, and as simple as those words were, they carry so much weight because 
I'm a guy who, when I become stressed out, it's what do I have to do? Like, what, what can I do? How, how do I make this situation come out the best way possible? Um, and, and it was in that time when my dad just told me, you're not the first person to have these problems, and you surely won't be the last. Right. Yeah. So It's that perspective, right? Yeah, you're, you're, it's not over. Yeah. yeah. You know, so no matter where the outcome lands, you are still the person who you were yesterday. Mm-hmm. You're still the person today, and you still will be tomorrow. That's good, you know what man. I mean? Um, obviously, take away from those failures or those messes that you may have, but make sure you keep that foundation. The, the, that foundation. Don't okay. tear everything up because one thing didn't go your way. Right. So right. good. Um, so I mean, it was just that simple yeah. for me. Um, but I thank you guys, honestly, for being here, especially in my time of need for this cut. <laughs> um, but honestly, since the season of COVID, we haven't had a lot of barbershop talks like this, you know. And I think, I think now with things kind of going back to normal, fingers crossed, that men will be able to have this open conversation. And hopefully at least outside of the barbershop, that we yeah. don't have to come to one space. But anytime I see Phil on the street or I see Tremaine or I see Tuan outside, we can have a heart to heart. It doesn't have to be within these four walls. Yeah, exactly. um, so again, I thank you all uh, for being able to come out and have this conversation with me. Um, thank you for the cut. My <laughs> <laughs> Blessing, you saved me. You saved me. It's crispy. It's crispy. It's a long time coming for you. I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm over here. But yeah. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we got the Resilient Men's Conference coming up October 20th and 21st. I'm super excited for you. We've been working hard on this, mm-hmm. especially you leading the way. I've been, it's been a pleasure following your lead. Um, I'm super excited to see what happens out. So yes. thank you guys for it's coming. Great for time. sure. Great for having me. Mm-hmm. Great for being here. Mm-hmm. Thanks for having me. Uh, Pastor Phil, Eli, Twan. Yeah. You know, it's amazing to be here. So yeah, thank you. For sure.